right. Thank you for watching this virtual lecture event hosted by the Institute of Rural Politics. For those of you who are new, IWP is a graduate school of national security, intelligence, and international affairs. We have five master's degree programs, 18 certificates of study, a doctoral program, and two new online Master of Arts programs. If you're interested in learning more about us, please visit iwp.edu. This lecture is a part of the 14th Annual Kosciuszko Chair Conference. This conference is sponsored by the Kosciuszko Chair of Polish Studies and the Center for Intermarium Studies. We'll be hearing from Ms. Agnes Teisner. Ms. Agnes Teisner recently graduated from the Institute of World Politics with a master's degree in statecraft and international affairs with a specialization in Russia and Central Eastern Europe. She'll be working for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation starting in January as a research fellow in Polish studies. Agnes also plans to continue her education by attending law school. Ms. Teisner, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for that introduction. I'm really looking forward to speaking about the evolution of active measures, um, how it's changed throughout the years, and specifically how we've seen a lot of this activity transfer into the digital domain and social media platforms today. So I'll start with a basic definition of active measures. It's a pretty loosely defined term depending on where the source is from. So if it's from the State Department, the FBI or the KGB, but very simply put, active measures were clandestine operations designed to deceive the target state and further the foreign policy goals of the Soviet Union. And of course, the same definition can be applied today to the Russian Federation. The term was officially coined in the 1920s, but uh, the US saw it mostly during the Cold War. Some common active measures tactics included the creation of front organizations, agents of influence, propaganda, and of course, disinformation. Most active measures conducted do contain some level of disinformation. One big common misconception about disinformation is that it's not flat out fake information or lies. There always tends to be a little bit of truth in the story so that it can be perceived as believable. And then the content or the plot is then filled with lies and greatly altered so that it's essentially changed into a new piece. The biggest obstacle that the US currently is facing is that the Russian state has been perfecting their craft of deception for centuries, and the US is only now recently learning how to combat these methods. So I wanted to show just a timeline of how long deception and political warfare has been in Russia's history. And we can go all the way back to pre-revolutionary Russia. We start with Ivan the Terrible who had first established the primitive secret police. We have Peter and Catherine the Great who continued this Russian espionage by spying on their own people as well as foreign adversaries. We have Alexander I who linked Russia's intelligence with the military. The Okhrana was formed after Alexander II was assassinated, of course, in October of 1917. That's when we have the Cheka, which was established by Lenin, which later transferred into the KGB, which was succeeded by the FSB and now the F, uh, SVR. So the point of this timeline is I just wanted to show that they have been doing it for so long and they are very good at it and they will continue to use these political warfare tactics against us. So in order to understand the goal of active measures or political warfare and why it's happening, it's important to look into Russia's national objectives and some of their main strategic goals. So these are in no particular order, but the first one is delegitimizing the US as a credible partner. 
And what that means is just promoting this worldview that the US is in serious decline, that we are unreliable and we're being led by an untrustworthy administration. And that's regardless of uh, the administration that is in office, the message will still be the same. Next, they would like to dominate the near abroad states and just have that buffer zone in the case that something would ever happen in the future. And this includes the trans caucus states, the Baltic states, and even as far as Central and Eastern Europe. But the goal is just keeping those states in their sphere of influence so that they don't align further with the West. Next, Russia would like to extend its influence beyond its immediate neighborhood. So that means persuading those decision-making elites in the US, Europe, the Far East to cooperate and try to understand Russia's perspective. Next, we have creating divisions and in Western institutions and alliances. So basically, Russia knows that it can't take the West on as a whole. So instead, if countries are pitted against one another, it's going to be a lot easier to take on individual countries. And lastly, and the most important, is to ensure the future of Putin's power and the future of his regime. Basically just making the world a safer place for authoritarianism, and that includes China as well. Through manipulating the media, Russia can reshape the world order to be more accepting of Putin's interests. So how is this done? Well, the more the world sees liberal democracies and the West in a negative light, then the easier it's going to be for Putin to keep his power, for Russia to assure its actions are justified, such as its um, oppressive security measures and things like this, and for authoritarian regimes in general to be seen as more attractive options than liberal democracies. So how is this accomplished? Well, in order to achieve this, Russia conducts disinformation and propaganda campaigns against the US and other countries, but the US in particular, in order to sow divisions within society and within its democratic institutions. So for example, reading disinformation online or watching the latest chaos on TV or on YouTube can cause information fatigue. And what I mean by this is there is such an influx of information and often different pieces of information contradicting one another that citizens are left questioning who to trust and can they even trust their own democracy. Essentially, if people become too overwhelmed with domestic events, and they stop caring altogether, then they end up being in a state of political paralysis. Um, if that happens, well, then these operations have ultimately succeeded. Another end goal, if that doesn't happen, is to trigger emotional reactions and drive people to ideological extremes. And so, what is the effect of people either not caring or being driven to ideological extremes? Well, by creating this disinformation and causing the further polarization in society, it becomes harder to deal with outside security concerns. And this is because the US will not be in a position to make coherent security responses when there is domestic chaos. So it's gonna be much easier for Russia or China or another state to um, move forward with their objectives if we uh, cannot handle our own situation at home. So next I would like to move on to the near abroad countries. And this is because they have been exposed to Russian tactics the longest. And as a result, they have developed some of the best strategies for combating disinformation. 
For example, in Estonia, after the 2007 cyber attack, the Cooperative Cyber Defense Center of Excellence, which is a NATO accredited cyber defense hub, was uh, based in Tallinn. They also have a digital national guard made up of civilian volunteers who actively fight dis uh, disinformation on a daily basis and will just uh, take off any sites or uh, disinformation that they see online. In Latvia, there is a primetime show dedicated to debunking Russian disinformation. In Ukraine, there is a stop fake news show that is bilingual. Lithuania has cyber warriors who troll the Russian trolls. And all of this is basically just a response to some of the major events that have happened in the past 15 years. So the military intervention in Georgia, the annexation of Crimea, the situation in Donbass that happened this year in uh, April. And thankfully that didn't result in the worst case scenario, but I believe that we should continue monitoring the situation and the area specifically because um, cyber and disinformation in the digital domain is probably where the future of warfare, a lot of it at least, will take place. So I wanted to look deeper into Ukraine and the annexation of Crimea. I won't explain the specific situation and how it exactly happened, um, but I wanted to look deeper into how they used disinformation and the political instability that happened from the propaganda and disinformation to make their move into Crimea. So before the official annexation, there were stories coming out saying that a fascist had taken power in Kiev in a coup ordered by the US and the EU, ousting a democratically elected president by force and that ethnic Russians in Ukraine face great danger from these ultra-nationalists. Then once the annexation was completed, there was more disinformation and propaganda, um, but this time the theme was to make the violent invasion look more like an intrusion used to help the people of Crimea. So there were articles about the eagerness of Ukrainian soldiers to voluntarily pledge alliance to Russia. Uh, stories were released about the legitimacy of the referendum. There were reminders that Crimea historically belonged to Russia and all of this while claiming that Russia had no involvement. The goal basically was to control the narrative in order to sway public opinion and overpower any voices that would incriminate the Russian state. So we can see how they used denial, deception, manipulating the media, and manipulating the information that was out there in order to legitimize their operation. Next, I would like to switch gears back to the uh, US. So active measures have been present for decades, but it wasn't until the 1960s that these operations first gained traction and became more widespread. And this was because of the expanded efforts of Yuri Androv. He was the head of the KGB in 1967 and he expanded the Service A department. And this was a department that focused specifically on active measures. So there were three main instruments that the Soviet Union utilized during the Cold War. And this was disinformation, of course, forgeries and agents of influence. Disinformation has been and still is one of the most successful weapons in the active measures arsenal. A preferred method at the time 
was to plant a story in a foreign newspaper that was actively actually being run by the KGB. And one of the most popular disinformation campaigns was known as Operation Infection. This was a story that was planted in an Indian newspaper, The Patriot, which accused the US Army of creating AIDS in a lab. The story contained an anonymous letter from New York to the editor of the Indian newspaper, blaming the scientists at Fort Detrick, Maryland for the spread. And they chose Fort Detrick in particular because it was home to the US Army's Germ Warfare Laboratory from 1943. At first, the story actually had little impact, but it started to gain traction when a doctor known as Jacob Segal offered explanations and a hypothesis on how the virus could in fact be created by scientists in the lab. Segal, of course, was no ordinary doctor. He had connections to the KGB and the Soviets were able to boost his credibility by stating that he was an expert in the field. The story ended up spreading like wildfire and reached uh, over 80 countries. And to this day, there are still people who believe the story is not a hoax. We've seen it in movies in television shows and music. So that just shows the power of disinformation and how it can really influence people. The aid story is one of the most successful active measures operations to this day. So what makes um, a story more believable and successful is when it is paired with forgeries. And of course, there were many forgeries that occurred during the Cold War, but I wanted to point out this one notable example, and this involves the leak of KGB documents stolen by Robert Lee Johnson. He was an American who spied for the Russians. What had happened is the KGB provided the stolen Johnson documents to left-wing journalists and the documents contained information on US contingency plans for using nuclear weapons in Europe. However, the Soviets had made a small change in the document that had a dramatic effect. They altered a paragraph to authorize local commanders to use small nuclear weapons on neutral countries. The US could not clarify to the public which part of the document was forged because that would go against its own classification rules. So as a result, the documents went around for years and played on anti-US and anti-nuclear sentiments to sow division in the West. Next, we have agents of influence. This was another common tool. The typical agent of influence at this time was a journalist who used their writing skills to influence the public and publish Soviet disinformation or propaganda. And we have here Claudia Wright. She's an example of a journalist who spread Soviet disinformation into the mainstream sources such as the Financial Times, New Statesman, the Atlantic Monthly, and many other newspapers. So these three examples were just a small glimpse of all active measures operations that happened during this time. But I believe it's important to analyze 20th century disinformation campaigns and active measures. So if there are any similar patterns today, then they can be recognized. Most 20th century disinformation operations have simply been forgotten and the most successful operations are starting to lose their relevance today. The US cannot neglect the lessons from the Cold War if the US hopes to improve its strategy for today. And that brings us to active measures in the 21st century. So it was initially believed that 
after the Soviet Union collapsed, active measures would suddenly disappear, but instead they have adapted to the digital domain. And since the adoption of technology and the widespread use of social media, active measures have largely converted to rely on communication platforms. Today, a false story can reach up to millions of people with just a simple click of a button. And the greatest part of all of this is that the true identity of the users can remain hidden. So some of the most common ways today that disinformation is spread is through social media trolls. And these are uh, real people impersonating a fake person under a fake account, but they are themselves physically putting out that information versus an automated account. So a bot, which is a computer that is putting out the information. And there have even been cases of people who had uh, their real Facebook and Twitter accounts, which have been active for five or 10 years, and uh, they had been paid off to spread disinformation. So overall, the internet has made active measures cheaper, quicker, and more reactive. As a result, because of the internet, Active measures are harder to control and assess than they ever have been. That brings us to the 2016 election. And this is when we started to see a lot of uh, these fake accounts and a lot of this disinformation going around. The US did not realize the damage that disinformation could do until months after the election. However, the operation to influence Americans already began in the spring of 2014 with the Internet Research Agency, which worked directly with the Kremlin and Russian intelligence. The IRA had a workforce of about 400 trolls who were working 12-hour shifts to spread disinformation and they even created a new branch within the agency known as the American Desk. They sought employees who were fluent in American English, uh, who understood the main political issues in our country and what issues caused the most tension between Americans. Uh, they studied American online behavior, such as what made Americans angry. They learned how to speak and write like them. And after learning how to argue online with people, they would focus on topics that would already deepen present divisions in American society. And with the heightened political climate prior to 2016, this wasn't a difficult thing to do. So now I would like to go into some examples of how disinformation was spread during this time and how we can recognize if an account is being run by a troll or a bot. Um, and all of these examples are from spotthetroll.org. It's a good source. Um, to see if you can tell the difference between a fake account and a real account. And I won't be able to go over all of them today, but just the main ones. So this Chloe Evans account is an example of an account that the IRA first started with in 2014 and 2015. The goal of Chloe Evans type accounts is to spread fear. They would push hoax events that never happened. So some of the events that they spread was uh, the Ebola outbreak in Atlanta. There was apparently a salmonella infected uh, turkeys being sold in New York. And then this example that we have here is a chemical explosion killing horses in Louisiana. Of course, this is a fake story. This is photoshopped to look real, uh, doctored graphics, stolen images. 
And as I mentioned earlier with the definition of disinformation, uh, these accounts didn't really turn out to be effective because there always has to be some kind of truth in these stories. They can't just be flat out fake information or lies. And that's why a few people took these, um, didn't take these accounts seriously. Um, and then on the left, we have um, examples of how the early accounts were automated by a computer. Most of the time they were um, through a bot and not a person. So they were programmed to post famous quotes and song lyrics in an attempt to seem human. So these weren't successful because nobody was believing these stories. So then they kind of changed their tactic. Uh, this account known as Harmony, uh, the IRA ran hundreds of accounts like Harmony and the intended audience for this account is to attract right-leaning users. Her account doesn't have a lot of fake news uh, posts or um, lies like the previous account but you can see that she's painting the other side as evil and telling her followers how to think about the story. So as we see, she's, she says the demo rap party. So how can we tell that this is a fake account? Well, there's a lack of personal info. There's nothing on her profile except for politics, she has no information about family, schoolwork, friends, pets, et cetera. Um, and then in order to seem more real, she does retweet some prominent voices like Melani Trump. And this intention is to retweet positive content to gain credibility and connect with her target audience. So not having personal information on the account is not always an indicator that it's fake, but it's definitely a red flag, especially if all the posts are also political. Next, we have the example of Chris, and this is actually a real account. And how we can tell that this is real is because he has pictures of his family, he has a place uh, of where to eat in his hometown, we can see that his posts lean conservative, but he still pokes fun at Trump. He was worried about the media overblowing the danger of COVID, but you can see with uh, the picture on the bottom left that he's also concerned with the impact that the virus has on the world. And he's promoting this message of peace, essentially. Uh, typically trolls, their views are one dimensional and they're not gonna be promoting any middle ground or any message of peace. So this is an example of a real account. So this is Amy, this is similar to the previous right-leaning account, Harmony, but the intention of Amy's account is to attract left-leaning users and then manipulate her audience by making, um, no, by causing further divides in society. The IRA had dozens of accounts that engaged in the Black Lives Matter community. They even ran their own activist organization known as Black Matters US, as we can see in the left corner right here. So they would use these accounts to promote uh, this page that they created. And this website was entirely fake. Uh, they even had a newsletter, a social media campaign, and even a podcast. So once again, we can see that this account is fake because it's all political and there's no personal information. So going off of the last thing, the Black Matters organization that I mentioned, um, they also went as far as to create events and as we see, this gained a lot of popularity. Uh, 33,000 people were interested. Almost 17,000 people said they were going. 
And they would even go as far as to um, reach out to activists who were interested in these events and ask them if they would speak at the actual events. Um, so, you know, although the whole idea was fake, it gained a lot of attention. Uh, next, we have the Heart of Texas. And this was a very popular page on Facebook that, uh, you know, they just talk about controversial issues. Uh, they talked about immigration, the border wall, illegal aliens, anything to just cause fights between the two sides um, and make us more polarized than we already were. Overall, the IRA had a really big impact. Um, at least 126 million Americans uh, were reached on Facebook through the IRA, 20 million people on Instagram, 1.4 million people on Twitter, and it's reported that they spent about 15 million on the 2016 disinformation campaign in total. And of course, we saw this repeated before the 2020 election. Troll farms reached 140 million Americans a month on Facebook. And this doesn't always happen necessarily because of choice, because people are clicking on, this page, on these pages, but it's mostly because of Facebook's algorithm. So 75% of the people who never even followed these pages, they were still seeing it on their feed because of Facebook's content recommendation system. And the troll farms were reaching the same main groups as they were during the 2016 election for the 2020 election. So I want to show some charts about the most popular Facebook um, pages that were present in October of 2019. 19 out of the top 20 pages of Christian uh, group pages were run by troll farms. 10 out of the top 15 African American pages were run by troll farms. And four out of the top 12 Native American pages were run by troll farms. So what are some possible solutions? How can we make sure that this doesn't continue? Well, instead of taking a minimalist approach like we currently are, the US could provide warnings to Russian leaders, both in public and in private, that they will be held accountable. Another option is we could follow in Reagan's footsteps and create another active measures working group. And this, can, uh, this group can specifically focus on the new threats and operations for today. And maybe they could even develop relationships with social media companies um, in order to provide real-time information. The US could then vouch for its allies to create similar agencies so that we could all share information between one another. Another source I found said that the best way to deal with this was to target Moscow directly. And that means isolating Russia economically, militarily, diplomatically. So the first option, impose heavy sanctions on those involved in active measures. Uh, the only problem is sometimes I think sanctions are not always effective. I think Russia has seemed to find a way around them. So I'm not sure how effective this option in particular would be. Uh, the U.S. could also expose corruption in Russia. So, for example, their human rights abuses and just make it more public how they use active measures and disinformation. U.S. intelligence agencies could work directly with the White House to declassify information for the public. This is definitely a more risky approach because um, it's more sensitive topics, but 
it is something to consider. Washington could also attempt to weaken Moscow militarily, and that means through providing over and covert assistance to countries such as uh, Georgia and Ukraine. And by making these countries stronger, in a way, we're making Russia weaker. Uh, lastly, the U.S. can educate its citizens about disinformation and active measures through programs in high schools, university uh, workplaces. But the most important thing that the U.S. can do is to keep on fighting active measures and continue exposing disinformation at all costs. So what does active measures look like today? Well, disinformation, propaganda, cyber attacks, they didn't stop after the elections. Russia continues to use social media and the internet in general, mostly Facebook and Twitter, to pit Americans against one another. The goal is to generate so much noise that the public ends up uh, disbelieving all media outlets. And essentially, if there are no objective truths that people believe in, then democracy cannot function. Without trust in the institutions of the US, trust in the press, and trust in the citizens of the country, so what I mean by that is if we are so polarized and living in this, these political uh, tribal groups and have this attitude of if you're not with me, you're against me, then democracy will essentially fall apart. Of course, this is a worst case scenario and hopefully that doesn't happen. But um, the longer that the US waits to develop an effective strategy to combat active measures, then the more advanced Russian capabilities become. So one of the things we can do is just be more cautious of what we share and what we read online. And if we are aware that manipulation is the goal, then we are less likely to have our emotions manipulated. So that is all for today. Uh, I hope it was useful and thank you very much.